Time limits are a divisive, commonly used mechanic dating all the way back to coin-operated arcade cabinets. Despite being found across nearly every genre of gaming, I can't think of many titles that have time limits for major events, let alone the entire story itself. The development team of the first game had a grand vision of time-based reactivity as a core concept. However, the majority of their design would never see the light of day. This is Fallout's Lost Time Limit. Ha! Ah, you're here. Good. We've got a problem. A big one. After loading up a new game, the Overseer tells you that the Vault needs a new water chip, and in four to five short months they'll run out of drinking water. Then you're dumped into a cave, and upon checking the Pip Boy, you find you have only 150 days to retrieve the chip. This relatively simple setup gives the first section of the story a real urgency. Something missing from future games in the series and most open world games in general. Rather than aimlessly wandering the wasteland, collecting junk and building settlements, the Vault Dweller has a deadline that forces you to focus on the main quest or everyone you know will die. The Overseer hints there's another vault to the east, but traveling across the radioactive waste and junk towns of a devastated California takes time, something you don't have a whole lot of. Your speed on the world map is affected by several factors. The Outdoorsman skill and Pathfinder perk increase your speed, adding another layer of strategy to character creation. The terrain also affects movement. City tiles take 6 hours to travel through, desert and ocean tiles both take 10, and mountain squares take 20 hours. This makes it potentially faster to move around a mountain tile than to go over it, adding some tactics to the path you take. Desert tiles are faster than mountains, but they do have random dehydration encounters. In them, the game checks the player's inventory for a water flask, and if they have one or more, all of them are removed from the player's inventory, saving the Vault Dweller from dehydration. If the player doesn't have a flask, the game rolls a check against the player's outdoorsman skill instead. On a critical success, the search for water takes only an hour. On a non-critical success, it takes that hour and then rolls a d6 for additional time taken, meaning the search can last for up to 7 hours. Failing that check triggers a roll for both damage and time. Depending on the encounter and roll, it can deal up to 24 damage and advance the clock by up to 12 hours, eating up half a day. Apart from traveling, time is also spent in a variety of ways. As you travel around the map, you run into random encounters and take damage. Stem packs are the best option to heal as they don't take time to use, but you can also run out of them. There are several doctors you can pay like Doc Morbid and Razlo to heal you, but this advances the clock by 1200 seconds times the amount of HP healed. The medic at Vault 13 doesn't charge and takes less time to heal you than other doctors, but you also have to go out of your way to get to him. You can wait to heal yourself by using the Pet Boy's alarm clock, saving your stem packs and caps for another day, but burning up precious time. The amount you heal per hour of rest is affected by your endurance, so high endurance characters waste less time healing. Medical skills can also fix crippled limbs and restore HP, but each use burns up an hour of time, and each skill can only be used a few times per day. Reading skill books increases your skills, but also kills time. It takes a 10 intelligence player an hour to read a book, but 10 hours for a 1 intelligence character. There are 38 skill books, meaning it takes just short of 16 days for a low intelligence character to read all of them, which is a significant time sink. You're also encouraged to wait around or return to locations later, as time must pass for some quests to become available. For example, two days after killing the rad scorpions plaguing Shady Sands, Tandy is kidnapped by the Khans. Some items like the flares in Vault 13 respawn after a set amount of time. Merchants have their caps replenished each day and some vendors are only open during certain hours, potentially giving you another reason to waste time. Traveling to locations with NPCs takes time too, as going back and forth from the Rat Scorpion Cave takes a total of 3 hours. 
The player can receive implants from the Brotherhood to increase their special stats, but these operations can take up to three weeks each. On level 3 of Vault 13, you can use the science skill on some of the computers for 350 experience from each, but it takes six hours. There's also a chance you fail the intelligence check, and if so, you'll waste six hours surfing the interweb and gain nothing. There's also glitches related to the time limit. For example, traveling from the hub to Irwin's farm and back takes over three weeks on the pit boy, but only reduces the water chip timer by two days. None of these actions take that much time alone, but when combined, you can see a delicate balance between player actions and time as a resource. There are three cinematics called Boil linked to how much time has passed. The first is played at 50 days and the second at 100, giving the player a Remind Boy message the vault is almost out of water. At 150 days the game ends, but you can extend the time limit. Finding the water merchants at the hub will add 100 days before the vault dwellers perish, for a total of 250 days. Now it takes around a week to make the trek from Vault 13 to Vault 15, where you discover a ruined facility and new water chip. The player can then potentially waste more time returning to the Overseer to tell him there was nothing there. Most players will discover Shady Sands during the trip, and there Ian will give the player directions to the hub. There are two NPCs at the hub who will give you information about your quest, leading the player to the Necropolis where they find the chip and save the day. Assuming the player isn't fucking around, 150 days is more than enough time to retrieve the water chip and save the vault. In fact, the speedrunning record now stands under 5 minutes, as it's possible to avoid the water chip quest entirely by killing the master and destroying the military base before 150 days pass. Fergus Urquhart revealed that they didn't account for that because they didn't think players could even do it. Interestingly, the initial time limit seems to have been shorter originally, as the guide mentions having only 120 days before the end. I think 150 days was perfect though, as it isn't so fast that you're rushed, but you still need to focus a bit. There's also a cut line suggesting the player could have returned to the vault and given up searching for the water ship, which seemingly would have resulted in a game over. You are taken away and slowly returned to normal vault life. But a month later, disaster strikes. The Unity will bring about the Master Race. Master! Master! One able to survive, or even thrive, in the Wasteland. In the unpatched release, there was a second timer where Vault 13 would be invaded by the mutants after 500 days, which would end the game. A post-launch patch would alter this time limit to 13 years, giving you essentially no time limit. Short of aimlessly wandering the desert for years, the only way to trigger the invasion cinematic is to tell the Master or Lieutenant the location of Vault 13. This was a welcome change to much of the fanbase, but it also removed the entry's most interesting element, timed reactivity. It would also make a bit of a disconnect in the story, like the Brotherhood not training you because of the impending mutant invasion, even though they're a decade away from being attacked. Stuff. I could teach you how to fight, if you had any ability. But the High Elder decreed no training of new recruits until the threat of invasion passes. There's conflicting evidence as to why the time limit was removed. Tim Kane has stated it was patched out because QA testers on the team didn't like the feature, and it was one of the biggest complaints of early customers. However, Chris Taylor, the team's biggest supporter of the time limit, mentioned something much different. There were a few things I screwed up that we really didn't get a chance to finish. We had this hidden timer that ran, and I wanted it to have much more of an effect on the world, and for the players to see it. But we never pulled it off, so we took it out in the first patch. We succeeded a lot of times. We failed a lot of times. And sometimes what we did was just okay. But we made that attempt to make a very reactive, very personalized game experience. As Chris mentioned, there were plans for more time-based reactivity. One of the earliest release design documents mentions this in regard to the Children of the Cathedral. Instead of throwing this whole group to the vats, the Master had bigger plans for these. 
They were to become as spies, as eyes and ears in the human settlements. For the next few years, the cultists spread into human society, bringing small technological gifts to the scattered towns in a show of their goodwill. These trinkets were of course from the master who had thousands of devices in his secret base. The cultists would infiltrate towns, slowly gaining followers and spreading their corruption, then send word to their master. When the master's mutants arrive at the town, the cultists make sure the town's arsenal is sabotaged and the people are caught off guard. As time passed, children of the cathedral NPCs would have expanded into some major settlements, adding medic NPCs who offered cheap healing. It seems this design was never fleshed out as there's only a few remaining instances of it. One of them occurs in Junktown, where after 80 days a children medic appears not far from Doc Morbid. There seems to be a cut line where Morbid mentioned their lower medical prices were driving him out of business. Each time you use one of the children healers, it removes a day from the counter for Vault 13 being invaded, in addition to the time it takes to be healed. Morpheus still has lines about this expansion reaching as far as Shady Sands, potentially implying their healers were meant to appear in every settlement over time. Our glorious effort has just reached Aditum, and of course, the hub shines with our efforts there. But I have a feeling there's more you wish to ask. These are wondrous days. Junktown now joins in Aditum and the hub in our quest to save body and soul. Is there more you wish to know, my child? The children's vision now stretches from Aditum to the hub, Junktown, and now gently caresses Shady Sands. Why do you ask? It is the uniting by the holy flame of all people, of all races, and the cleansing of the heathens from this world. Settlements were also meant to have been invaded by the Master's army if he wasn't quickly defeated, something that's still mentioned in the bad endings of each location. This would have heavily encouraged the player to destroy the Master before going to the military base, as killing him was the only way to stop towns from being attacked. The Vault Dweller memoirs even made a canon that the player killed the Master first. There are two endings depending on if the player destroys the Master or the military base first, but ironically, the canon ending for destroying the Master first is bugged and never plays. You managed to destroy the Vats. Then you killed the Master before he could realize his twisted plans. With the Master gone, his armies flee to the east in fear of retribution from the remaining normal. The death of the Master was the first major step towards ending his mad dream of conquest and enforced peace. But it is the destruction of the Vats that neutralizes the mutant threat. Without the ability to create more mutants and enforce their harsh brand of justice, the mutant armies flee to the east, beyond the no-man's land. Despite being almost completely cut or patched out, the official guide still references the invasion mechanic, stating, Once the super mutant invasion begins, it continues to advance north, taking one location after another. Your home vault will fall on about day 500. These timeline figures can be adjusted up or down depending on other events that take place in the game. As mentioned, the timeline for invasions could be shortened by certain in-game actions. The guide mentions that destroying the vats will make it occur faster, and it can, but only if you destroy them in a very specific way. Most players will use the science skill on the control computer, which has no effect on the timer whatsoever. However, if you have a low intelligence character, you have no choice but to blow up the computer using TNT or plastic explosives. Bizarrely, this method alone cuts the remaining invasion times for the Hub, Lost Hill, Shady Sands, Vault 13, and Junktown in half. It doesn't affect the first two locations that get invaded though, Necropolis and the Boneyard. The guide suggests their intention was for this to happen regardless of how it was destroyed, but unfortunately this scripting oversight means it won't happen for most players. The water merchants can add 100 days to the water chip time limit, but doing this also causes Vault 13 to be invaded 90 days earlier. This only happens if there's more than 100 days left on the timer though. It seems the idea was that by revealing the location of the vault to caravans, the master would find it faster. 
The guide also mentions the attack would happen 100 days earlier, even though it isn't set up like that. Tim Kaine and Chris Taylor wrote a walkthrough for the game, and they mention the amount of time added to the water chip timer by the water merchants is also subtracted from the invasion timer, suggesting they did intend for it to reduce the Vault 13 attack by 100 days. This still happens in the final version, but 90 days doesn't make much of a dent in the post-patch time limit. The timing of the invasion seems to have been altered multiple times too, as the guide mentions it occurring in only 250 days, which might have been the original timeline. The excerpt from the guide also mentions the player could add more time to the invasion timer, giving you some extra space to complete side quests. However, there are no actions that actually add time to the invasion variables, and that sentence in the guide is seemingly the last remnant of a cut idea. There's conflicting evidence to many of the invasion dates, suggesting the exact design specifications were never finalized. The followers are set up to be attacked first, and it would have happened after 90 days, but Laura has lines suggesting Atatum and the hub would have been attacked beforehand. We sent a group to help Atatum, and they were all wiped out. Nicole sent another one to the hub. I just hope they get there in time. They've already taken out the hub and Atatum. We think the followers are next, so we're preparing our defense. Butch has a TMA line about Atatum getting invaded as well. Why? What have you heard? I heard it had been ransacked, but no one knows who did it. But, uh, I'm not worried. No. Either way, part of the Boneyard would have been hit first, likely because of its proximity to the Cathedral. The Followers' invasion is much more complete than the attacks for other areas, and gives us a good idea of how other areas might have played out. After 90 days, you would have found the Followers dead, and various NPCs from the Master's army ransacking the library. If you entered during the day, the player would have found a character named Alert Scout, a member of the Trolldren who would have warned you the Boneyard had been conquered by big bad monsters, and that the Trolldren were trying to save what they could from the library before the mutants returned. If the player told them they were a follower, it seems the scout would have taken you to the Trolldren at the library who would have attacked you. If you said you were a member of the Trolldren, he would have asked you for proof. The player could mention they helped kill the followers, help kill the Reppers, or that you had killed super mutants or members of the Trolldren, the latter two of which could have resulted in a fight. The mention of the Reppers suggests this was implemented early in development, as that faction was completely cut too. Some dialogue choices would have caused him to direct you to the leader of the Trolldren in the Boneyard, senior member Orpheo. The scout mentions Orpheo would have rewarded you for killing the followers, but Orpheo's dialogue seems to only result in two outcomes. A fight, or being taken to be cleansed from the impurities of the wasteland, likely a reference to being taken to the master. Orpheo also would have been hostile to the player if they destroyed the cathedral or the military base. Inside the library, you'd find children initiates and scholars. The initiates have lines like, those loser followers were easy to kill. Now that the followers are out of the way, the rebuilding can start. By the end of this search, I hope to be a scribe or scholar, and Orpheo is a difficult person to work with. The scholars would have mentioned what they were searching for, stating, Somewhere around here are the plans of the followers. I am certain that the followers had a list of all their allies. Somewhere there has to be a list of all the followers, and those fools should have known better than to mess with our god. They also would have mentioned they could only search during the day, as Nightkin were found here during the night. The Nightkin came to us a while ago. They might be hideous mutants, but they are extremely loyal to the children. As we all are. The monsters who would have appeared here at night were Generic Nightkin, Thinker Nightkin, and Super Mutant Scouts. A deaf note about the Nightkin mentions, My interpretation is that these boys are smarter and more cunning than the Garden Variety Super Mutants. However, Generic Nightkin here would have talked like low intelligence characters, and would have said lines like, Me was told to take you to do something. Something about normies. Me no remember what. Boss says normies are nothings. 
Don't know why boss wants these books. And me glad those stupid normies ain't around. They ugly. The Nightkin scouts seem to have been more intelligent, and when talking to one they would have said, What do we have here? A normal. I think you will come with me. You could agree to be taken, or ask how to get to their leader on your own. Where they would have mentioned, With the quickest of haste, look for Uthern. He will set you straight. And, Uthern wants to see you. Seems he's heard of you. Uthern is an interesting NPC who would have been found somewhere in the Boneyard post-invasion. He's described as the leader of the mutant scouts in one file, and the leader of the super mutants in another. When approaching him, he would have initiated a conversation and said, Normie, how dare you enter the confines of your betters? You could start a fight immediately by saying, Scum like you could never be better than humans, or die, mutie. You could also attempt to engage in a philosophical battle, but the conversation only has two potential endings. Getting into combat against him, or him taking you to the master. It's unknown if Uthern was an early version of the Lieutenant or an entirely different character. It's possible that each settlement would have been invaded by a Lieutenant-esque NPC, either providing a difficult battle or taking the player to the master. The Bad Followers ending checks three variables. First, the code checks a variable called Master Blown to see if the master is still alive. And if so, it then checks if 90 days have passed. In a previous video, I mentioned the last variable involved a children spy who had infiltrated the followers, but I was totally wrong. The scripting for the ending conditions is hard-coded, which has led to a lot of misinformation regarding the triggers for endings. It actually tracks the player training the followers' guards in combat, but that entire class of NPCs was cut. Nothing references the variable, so the good ending can never be attained and the followers are always destroyed. The mutant armies, led into battle by the fierce super mutants, destroy the followers of the apocalypse. Barely human carrion feeders pick over the followers' remains. When the invasion was cut, the variable was amusingly recycled to track how many Brahmin the player killed. I don't believe this one, but uh, some say an army of mutants is on the way. <laughs> the Necropolis would be invaded next, and this is the only settlement that still gets attacked in the final version. If you enter the city after 110 days, you find its inhabitants dead and hostile super mutant invaders in their place. This will also happen if you kill the mutants at the watershed and return after 30 days. The guide mentions multiple different dates for this event, another example of the invasion's incomplete state. Another section mentions the invasion timer doesn't actually start for any settlement until you enter Necropolis. This isn't how it's set up to work, but it might have been the original intention, as it would have given the player more time to complete their quest. After it's attacked, the player can find a ghoul refugee who will mention, The super mutants attacked. We were slaughtered. They had guns and bombs, even some steam trucks. These steam trucks are never shown or mentioned again, but it's a cool detail the Master's Army had working vehicles. After Necropolis is invaded, children healers appear and once again using their services removes a day from the invasion timer. If you kill any of the super mutants here, they won't heal you anymore, however. This early image of the area also shows a centaur, a child, and a dog at Necropolis, none of which appear here in the final game. It's unknown if these characters were placed here for one of the game's demos, or if the area's layout was originally much different. Every time you enter any map, the game checks the invasion variables for the ending slides. Strangely, this code doesn't update Necropolis' ending, though, and the only way to update it is to enter the map after 110 days pass. The mutant attack on Necropolis spares none of its ghoulish inhabitants. After the mutant armies advance, they leave a truly dead city behind them. This means you can avoid the bad ending by not entering the city after that much time passes. The hub would be invaded and trigger a bad ending at 140 days unless the master was dead. For the good ending, you also needed to trigger a variable named Be Kind to Harold. The variable isn't referenced though, so it's unknown how you would have been kind to him. With your assistance, 
Old Harold brings the ghoul population of the hub into equality with the humans. The two sides work together and the hub prospers. Old Harold is still alive, as far as anyone knows. Since the variable isn't used, the good ending never occurs and the ending slide is never seen, leaving the hub to always be invaded. The hub disperses before the might of the mutant army and will never recover. The Vault 13 design document also mentions something very interesting. The lieutenant, who controls the VATS, has taken a more covert stance in the acquisition of new recruits. The mutants now attack and capture caravans from the hub and any small groups of travelers. The groups are made to look as if they just disappeared into the desert. The roots of the caravans are relayed to the lieutenant by the children of the citadel who have a temple in the hub. A stronghold was secretly recently built by the mutants near the hub. From here they launch their raiding parties. Early in development, it seems they planned a mutant stronghold near the hub, one that the player likely needed to destroy, but there's nothing like that in the final game. The Brotherhood Bunker would have been invaded after 170 days. The post-invasion map still exists and is called Bro Dead, depicting the Brotherhood Bunker destroyed. Butch has an unused tell me about when asked about the Brotherhood, likely related to their destruction. I heard he's dead. What more do you need to know? The Brotherhood's endings are dependent on several variables. The Master being alive or dead after 170 days, if the Vault Dweller becomes an initiate of the faction, and another called Brotherhood Enemy. The latter is triggered by trying to lockpick your way inside Lost Hills, or by attacking any Brotherhood NPC. There are three Brotherhood endings, one where they become a major research and development house, another where they become a dictatorship, and a cut ending where they're invaded. The cut ending revolved around a cut traitor named Kedrick, who the player needed to expose. The Brotherhood of Steel repels the first wave of mutant invasion, but a traitor in their midst causes the Citadel to fall. Fortunately, the advanced technology is mastered slowly by the mutants and they were unable to use it against you. This character was mentioned in concept art and might have been shown in an early preview. Keytrick was cut though, and there's no scripting for the ending, so this variant can never occur either. Junktown is set to be invaded after 200 days. Disputing this date, Junktown's bad ending is set to occur after 230 days. But this ending can never happen, as the variable doesn't seem to be changed by anything. The mutants are slowed, but not stopped, by the brave defenders of Junktown. When the army finishes their brutal siege, nothing of Junktown remains. Shady Sands would have been taken at 230 days, leaving the player 270 days to destroy the Master before Vault 13 was captured. The mutant army marches as far north as Shady Sands, raising the small town to the ground. There's one more interesting character who might have been related to the invasion mechanic. There's a cut super mutant named Ray, and he's arguably the most interesting cut character in the entire game. He seemingly would have been found just outside the master's lair, and here's how one conversation would have gone. The player could say, you don't belong here. Ray's reply would read, seems confused and sad. I believe I do, but why are you here? Player. I'm here to contemplate the oneness of the master, Ray. Of course, the unity brings peace. May I ask where you're from? Player, I'm from a vault. I'm a pure strain human. Ray, why would you tell me that? I should take you before the master. Player, but you won't. Ray, you're right. If I could only clear my head, there's something. Player, I know why you can't clear your head. Ray, tell me, please. Player. You used to be human too. The master dipped you in the FEV virus and mutated you. Ray, that can't be. The master protects, unifies. Player, well, you're a living example of unification, my friend. I know, I've seen the process. I'm here to stop the master from unifying anyone else. Ray, ah, grabs his head in pain and confusion. I can't. Player, hey. I've got an idea. Let's cut open the master and see what's inside. Ray. Sorry, I can't. Player. I'm sorry you're in such pain, but it's the master's fault. Ray. 
Leave now or I will be forced to deal with you. Player, you know that it's true. That's why you're so confused. You're fighting the mutation. Help me avenge you by destroying the master. Ray, I will pull his eye out. I'll tear a slimy little head from its cables. You, get out of here. I'll take care of the master. There's a reference to a missing cinematic called Ray Kills the Master. It's unclear why the character was cut, perhaps the cinematic was never finished, or maybe it was axed because Ray cancelled out the other ending solutions against the Master. This is a little more than a crackpot theory, but the Boneyard was the first area that would be invaded, and there's a member of the Blades who has a very similar name, Mick Ray. This is only speculation, but maybe Ray would have only appeared after the Boneyard was attacked, and McRae was thrown into the vat, who then forgot part of his name. The idea of new mutants appearing as human settlements were invaded would have been really cool, but again, this is a tenuous theory at best. I asked developer Jesse Heinig about the invasion and he replied, as I recall, there was an unimplemented design idea in which the Master's army slowly radiated outward from the cathedral and the military base, so that over time various locations were overrun by super mutants. Places closest to the Master were hit first, and places further away had more time. This did result in the challenging problem that since the player started relatively far away, if they move slowly they might get to the hub and discover that it was already overrun, and never experience any of the story or characters there. In terms of the ratio of payoff to implementation time, this just wasn't as important as finishing the core functionality of the various zones. Given its state in the final game, the developers made the right choice in removing it, but if the invasion mechanic was expanded, if the attacks were better foreshadowed, and the player had more options to delay the attacks, it could have been an awesome addition. While some fans and even Tim Kaine dislike the time limit, I think it's the element that makes the first game truly special compared to every other entry. It would have given a pace and urgency to the entire main quest missing from all future games in the franchise. In future games, you can never fail anything and the world simply waits around for your decisions. But this was a grand vision for a world where events immersively occurred independent of the player's actions. A desperate fight to destroy the master before every safe harbor was conquered, leaving the Vault Dweller in a lonely wasteland where only irradiated monsters remained. The invasion mechanics could have made Fallout into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.